A self-described anti-capitalist cafe in Toronto has gone viral again on social media after announcing that it is closing its doors after just a year in business. The Anarchist Cafe made media headlines in March 2022 with many mocking its self-description as an anti-capitalist, anti-colonial cafe, shop and radical community space on stolen land. Among other things, critics pointed out high prices and the cafe's location in a gentrifying area. As one said, charging $5 for a coffee that costs 30 cents to make, that is capitalism. Don't lie and say you're for the people, $5 cappuccinos are not for the people. Right-wing outlets like Breitbart News have latched on and been taking great joy in the cafe's demise. In some ways, this is really a non-story. The cafe had one owner and no staff, and is therefore rather conventional in its economic structures. But the controversy brought out polarization in perspectives on what it means to be anti-capitalist. And I think some of the misunderstandings in the media frenzy which followed actually tell us a lot. I'm not defending the owner, or saying that I share his ideas or his way of communicating. However, does the failure of the cafe mean there are no alternatives to capitalism, as critics are implying? Of course not. It's somewhat strange that the right is so obsessed with someone who at the end of the day is an entrepreneur. The owner might self-describe as anti-capitalist and support some worthy causes, but to fixate on this as an anti-capitalist cafe is questionable. This is ultimately just the story of a small coffee shop going out of business in a competitive area. On the other hand, it does raise the interesting question of how much self-employment by what Marxists call the petty bourgeois is an element of capitalism given that the financial surplus generated from the cafe's economic activities goes to the owner as a form of self-exploitation rather than labour or wage exploitation per se. According to the cafe's website, there was an idea to eventually transition this enterprise to a workers' co-op, which would certainly be interesting and less orthodox, but things never got that far before the cafe was forced to close. The cafe's owner did engage in small social experiments with commodification and payment, famously in the form of pay-what-you-want drip coffees, which was the source of much mockery by its critics. These pay-what-you-want coffees were to complement the conventional sale of expensive coffees, and it isn't clear how much this approach actually contributed to the cafe's demise. Moving beyond the anarchist in Toronto, is there really no alternative in this space? There is a wide and flourishing solidarity and non-market food system. As one article in the journal Sustainability puts it, People everywhere and at all times garden, hunt, fish, forage and glean food that is not for sale. Even in the cores of neoliberal capitalism, where markets mediate most economic activity, people produce food to share, gift and consume within the household. And there are models of coffee shops and cafes which subvert free market logic at the very least. The tradition of the suspended coffee, now in operation worldwide, is just a small instance of a wide culture of gift economy. It at least shows that things can work differently. This started in Naples, Italy as an anonymous way of paying forward good luck, where someone pays for two coffees, donating one anonymously. It is an approach which has been replicated millions of times around the world. There are also many institutional examples of cooperative food service. One I am familiar with is the Key Co-op in Cork, Ireland, for example, which has very successfully operated as a democratically run workers' cooperative cafe and restaurant since the early 80s. It was founded in a prominent location in the city centre, amidst a depressed local economy, as a space for feminist, LGBT, environmental and other activists to meet and discuss political issues. To this day it thrives, serving ethical organic food, and is of course just one of many examples we could draw from worldwide. Another example is a very successful workers' co-op called Arismendi Bakery in San Francisco. It is named after a famous labour organiser and founder of the Mondragon Cooperative Group in the Basque Country of Spain. Arismendi Bakery has been running for over two decades in numerous locations. Using mostly organic and seasonal ingredients, it is worker-owned and operated, with decisions usually made by consensus. So, the story of the anti-capitalist cafe in Toronto might be overblown and characteristic of social media controversies, but more interesting alternatives are possible, out in the real world, and have been thriving for decades.